<laughs> All right, now that we have slides, we will begin. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our EDM program meeting. And so, as a reminder, this is a. Uh, you have a mic, too, yeah. Um, this is a IAB program, so it's a function that the Internet Architecture Board uh, has for technical discussion and, and trying to develop some technical documents and explore different areas. This is one that we've been running for several years now. We've produced uh, a couple of documents, and right now uh, we are working on discussing a document about greasing and trying to make some of the more either uh, more abstract things that we had in um, like this, uh, previous documents, like the user lose it draft, um, I forget the RFC number that that got published as, and also things that are more concrete to specific protocols in uh, TLS Greece um, and try to find a, a middle ground of how do we have concrete uh, recommendations for protocols going forward. Um, and so that's what we're going to be discussing today. That's kind of our only agenda item at this point. Um, we're thinking, you know, potentially for like lifetime of the group, we may uh, wrap up this program after kind of this uh, item develops. Um, there are some other programs that are also starting up within IAB, so you can follow those. All right. Um, so if you want to advance the slide. Yeah, great. Uh, so this is... A meeting under the note well, um, so please be familiar with uh, the terms of participating uh, in the IETF. Um, and, you know, of, of course, uh, we also uh, want to have good, friendly, and productive discussions here. So, and we appreciate all of you showing up. Great. All right, do you have any other slides? Or... Ah, yes, our agenda is Greece. Yes, um, so we have a document which is a draft, uh, what, a draft EDM protocol greasing that Lucas has uh, very kindly authored for us. Um, you, hmm? If anyone would like to come on board as a co-author or anything, I'm, I'm more than happy. That, that was my original understanding um, when volunteering to help with this yes. document. Is it on now? Yep, yep. Right. you're good. Uh, so last IETF meeting, I said, ask me in two months, because I had a bunch of things that I thought should be in there. Uh, now that it's been two months, um, I'd be willing to do it. Great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, as long as you're fine with me putting in the stuff that we talked about last meeting, where people kind of nodded and said, yeah, sure. Yep, become a co-author. So Yeah, sure. Um, not this month, but between this month, uh, between now and next IETF, I can probably help contribute stuff. So. Wonderful. Thank you. I will take note of that. Um, great. So I, I think a couple of things that would be good, good to cover on this document. Um, so a couple of us have done reviews and so we can kind of go over some of the points and talk about how we want to develop it. Um, also, I think there's some discussion of, you know, procedurally, like, you know, do we want co-authors on this? So thank you, Dave. Um, also, um, I, I B did discuss yesterday, um, actually like formally adopting it cause it's not on the IAB stream at this point. Um, and that's something I, I believe based on the discussion that we would like to do, you know, obviously acknowledging that it's an early version, but being able to, so part of the process there, um, for adopting an IAB document is that. Uh, a, like a notice would go out to the community of the IB is going to intend to, uh, you know, work on this document, and then you get a kind of a community-wide feedback period, um, and then the IB could vote to like, yes, we think this is worth doing, um, and then then we just you know kind of go along as normal. Um, so I guess just wanted to confirm that that is good, and maybe what we'll want to do is take the feedback that we have in this discussion, do another revision. And maybe, you know, Dave, if you want to come on board then and then sometime in this cycle before, you know, the next ITF meeting, at least do that proper adoption process. 
yeah, uh, that sounds good to me. The, the The current draft is reflects discussions to this point, but it could clearly do some editorial work and some additions. And uh, I would, would want to ask for community feedback right now because there's so much low hanging fruit. Um, yeah, I, I think we really want to make sure the community input is valuable mm -hmm. um, to the IEB's decision making. Yes, and again, procedurally, like there will also be. A like you know last call equivalent community feedback period so plenty of time <laughs> um great so maybe let's kind of dive into some of the discussion of the actual technical meat of it maybe Louise, if you want to just for all of us here oh um, may i interrupt just please just quite, quite briefly i'm looking at the note-taking tool um are we using the note-taking tool or are we using some um, notes somewhere doing notes somewhere else and if not is anyone taking uh. notes I was taking some notes of overall action points. If okay. someone else would like to volunteer to take notes, I would uh, deeply appreciate that. Okay, so if you, could, you, maybe you could copy paste anything you have over there, but I'll work yeah. On if, if you want to just start I'll, now, I'll, I'll work on the pad. Yeah, and then I, I can merge stuff later. Thank you. Great. Okay, so maybe if we could start with just a if you want to just su summarize what's in the document so far. And like the intent and then we'll go into some of the review comments and other people can bring up their thoughts as well yeah sure so the the elevator pitch here is that like tommy alluded to already we we do have some documents um already like I, we don't have the rfc numbers right in front of me here but um they talk very specifically about certain aspects and there was a feeling that there's a kind of a those for example greece talks about tls greasing and how to um use code points for some betterment of something. We don't, don't need to go into that detail right now, but that that's great. And something like Quick took across some of that recommendation and did its own equivalent to. Um, and once you have like one or two or three instances of this, is that a pattern that is useful? It's not a best common practice and it can vary by the, the specific nature of the protocol, but is there something we can extract that is gonna be uh, useful to other people? But that's just one element. Greece is very focused on code points. And if you have a large space of code points, trying to, to use some of that in a nutshell. Um, but there's other aspects that we've also um, experienced. And this is where we need more examples or use cases because uh, my view is tainted by Quick and, and that world um, where say we've had various kinds of interop, interop issues uh, because of expectations built into how implementations work. So for example, um, the certain specific ordering of or timing of uh, packets or frames or units of the protocol that communicate with each other and how varying just the size of those things can sometimes throw off the receiver such that they behave in a way that is not great. Um, and you could say, well, that, that's just interop testing. Uh, but the, the issue we've kind of highlighted in the discussion is that um, these things will work for an age until maybe somebody new comes into the ecosystem with an implementation or somebody tries to change something to fix a bug um, that they found and then suddenly the, the, the internet breaks because of unfortunate side effects. Um, and so this document was, was pitched at kind of filling the gap between some of those documents, not duplicating them as much as possible, but trying to give some concrete recommendations to people. So for example, if you have all of these code points, um, and you need to register them or provide some framework for IANA tables to refer to them, what's a good label to give them so that we're consistent? Um, and that's one of the specific feedback points um, Tommy had in his latest review. We say, we give an example of how you could do this. Should we just be more concrete and say, do this? Uh, so that it's clear to people what to do. Um, Uh, uh, great. That's Thank as you. much as I can summarize. Cool. Um, I guess, yeah, but before we talk about, you know, specific review points or things that we would like to see revised or added, anyone have kind of questions or thoughts on the scope or the purpose or kind of clarifying what are we trying to do here? I, I know, you know, Wes, when we were talking about this on Sunday, it was like, yeah, how, how is this different? So I guess do we think we're being clear in the purpose here based on what that was my ignorance from not having read the document so don't... <laughs> i love that I, yeah please 
Uh, press that. Okay. Can you just state your name? <laughs> okay, yeah. So this is uh, Hans Jörg from Odriga. So I may have some stupid questions because I just became aware of this session during dispatch and jumped in here. So apologize if there is, you know, misconception. Um, so what led me here basically is like, you know, one of the themes I'm seeing constantly about is like looking from a developer's perspective up on the work of the ITF and how that can be reconciled in a better way. Um, and a constant sort of personal frustration, uh, not blaming anybody here, but it's like how the data, how the RC stuff works in the data tracker and so on, because it's very much um, focusing, you know, on the document and it's, it's very hard to figure out, you know, there is related RFCs, but which is a recent one, where is test data, these kind of things. Um, there was a meetup in a recent, I think in the San Francisco ITF on open source community building with, um, um, within the uh, ITF, there was also, I think, in, gen, in, 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 gen, in the GEN meeting, there was a proposal, I think, in REC about also open source practices. Um, uh, and, and I just wonder how this fits together in here. Yeah? So is it the right place here or is this in scope? I feel like that a little bit, right? Um, or it's, I feel this is sort of related, but I'm, I don't know the history of this group here. So mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. that's my first question probably. <laughs> Sure. I mean, I think probably applies a bit more to, you know, the group and the overall discussion than maybe this particular document. But um, yeah, I, mean, I think what what we're trying to look at here is kind of like that intersection between, you know, what you need to practically do to deploy things, make sure that you can still evolve your protocols and maintain your protocols and have them work well. And how do we aid that by what we put in the documents mm -hmm. through the standards process and how do we uh, predict those things better? So I think, you know, particularly with uh, greasing, what we're trying to do here is like, hey, how do we distill uh, advice to the people writing the standards documents mm -hmm. to make uh, things more clear for implementers and life easier for the implementers long-term when they need to mm -hmm. uh, deploy a new extension so that things aren't broken mm -hmm. from the beginning. Um, so I think that's the, that's this focus. I, I mean, if, if there are other particular gaps also that you would like to highlight, you know, maybe outside of the scope of this document discussion, that'd be great to hear or like have those on the list. We have an EDM at IAB.org list. Yeah. I don't want to occupy the meeting, but I, I would have one more note probably. Mm -hmm. um, and so one observation I have, so my, my, Home, home base is uh, migration in a way or portability of data. Mm -hmm. And one of my, uh, my one of my observations is that um, in a lot of you know ITF focuses a lot of interoperability. Yeah, so, which is sorry, with... just really quickly, I see some hands up. If everyone wants to join the Q and Meet Echo, it'll be a lot easier for us okay, to sorry. know who who is there. No, no, go keep going. Keep but for everyone else, sorry, <laughs> there's, there's no queue right now. So like, so, so, let's get a queue. So, so one of the things, like you were mentioning, that could be part of such a template, and I don't know if this draft or another mm -hmm. one is like a recommendation to consider not just you know short term interoperability for certain uh, uh, drafts, but also this aspect of like what may happen in five years if systems implement these protocols. Um, and might there be implications, you know, um, that might need to be included in the protocols or data structures that might help or not help that. To, to give you an, an, an examples, like in the calendaring standards, there is methods like, you know, organizing an event. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but these methods actually, for instance, will, will instantly, if I invite you, will instantly send you an email like, you know, you got invited to the, this event. That works well in the live interoperability when I create it. But if I recreate it in a later you know, migration or portability scenario, many systems don't allow you to block this. Yeah? So you will, so if I migrate your legacy data where you got invited in the past, you get mm -hmm. new emails for that. Mm -hmm. This kind of thing. Yeah, I, mean, I think that type of thing is definitely within scope for discussion overall for me. Um, and then, you know, particularly on the aspect of, you know, how do you deal with things long-term over over time, uh, one of the documents that we published out of here you know, is trying to talk about like protocol maintenance and stuff. So that if you want to read up, um, that's RFC 9413. Yeah, cool. All right, we're gonna keep DKG. Uh, hi, uh, so I think a document like this is super useful, um, not just for the people who are writing the documents, but for also for reviewers. Hmm. Um, and I wonder whether we shouldn't talk about um, both for, you know, 
chairs and directorates and things to ask. Um, and there are concrete questions to ask, not just about code point greasing, um, but about, you know, if there are grammars, uh, does the, do the documents define behaviors for when things don't quite meet the grammar um, or for unknown things that show up in a grammar? Um, mm -hmm. So you've got, co you've got code points, you've got grammars, and then you've got for online protocols, you know, you have like, you know, re out of order delivery or, or things like that, 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 that come in. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, I think it's useful to say when you're reviewing a document like this, has there been any effort to think through the space that is not in the document, right? Like that's really what the greasing stuff is about. Right? Right. We, we have a, right. we have a, we define how, how things work today and there's some space that's ill-defined because we know we don't know everything yet. And, um, you know, I, I think you said that's just interop testing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we should be doing more of that, right? We should be explicitly asking folks what sort of interop testing has been done and right that we should have documents that describe what a good interop test suite looks like um you know i i'm i'm co-chair in the open pgp working group we are finally mm -hmm. getting that draft out the door mm. and we have thanks to a bunch of implementers a good interop test suite now Great. that we never had before that's finding bugs in implementations from rfc 4880 actually probably from rfc 2440 because both of those documents never contemplated giving guidance for what to do when you reach stuff that's not in this document. Yeah. Yep. So, so I, I, I mean, I think we should be talking about, you know, the running code aspect of things with, with interop. Now, open PGP interop testing is completely different from online protocol interop testing. You know, we, we have, there's, there's different things that we need to deal with. Um, but mm -hmm. we, you know, the community's never had that before. And it's been super useful. So I would love to see documents like this um, advance with a goal of describing what the reviewers should be thinking about, not just what the folks who are writing it. Yeah, I, I, I really like the point of you know giving these requirements or criteria for that audience of reviewers as well as the authors and people developing it. To the point of like the running code, because I I also think you know, it's something we've discussed here before, and. I'm just you know wondering about kind of like you know scope of document or how to talk about these things because um, like you know, we had the other discussions about you know do we have better recommendations on how to you know, find code or like talk about if if you have interop test matrices how to make those more part of a working group process or protocol development um, and so like, are are you imagining that as being something you want to see folded into this effort or like more just like a parallel thing like what what, what is the right way to actually promote these intro tests because I, I see them in some groups and for some protocols but then there are like large swaths where the tooling isn't there the practice isn't there and it's like the, the startup cost to do that seems to be too high the startup people... cost is high exactly right just like for i mean if you're a software developer if you try to do test driven development you're like spend the first couple yeah. months of work writing your tests that all fail initially and it's mm -hmm. super frustrating people outside say what have you gotten done and you say nothing nothing mm -hmm. works right mm -hmm. so but we need to i mean we can say this is part of the development process right you do need to to spend those costs if you want to convince people that you've that you've thought through the issues right i, I mean if the re if the reviewers say, show me how you are thinking about the stuff that's not in this document. Show me what you know. Do you have guidance for that? Do you ha can you show what happens to your tooling? But the other piece that you know is supposed to be a bad word in ITF is that is is API work. API work builds. API work. You can't do interop testing without functional API work. And as long as we pretend that we don't do API development here, we're not going to facilitate good interop testing. All, all good thoughts. Yeah, let's move on, uh, Drew. So just to answer to your question earlier, uh, there was a document uh, about in EDM, also it was discussed about finding related implementation. Uh, so we have a document. So even if you have features like that, where you think the data tracker can improve, we can discuss it here as well as we can take it to tools team with ideas and you can file them in Git, uh, GitHub as a uh, request as well. So over, even those meetings are open. 
So if you have ideas on improving this, please continue to participate. Thank you. Uh, sorry, briefly for the Dave, notes, um, you mentioned oh. a document. Could if you could track, oh. um, file that on the chat. Thanks. I will, I will what? Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Dave. Dave Saver. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, since there's actually quite a few people here that weren't here at IETF 117, just wanted to repeat some of the comments that I made there as to why I volunteered to become a co-author on this one, because people said, yeah, sure. Contributions gratefully accepted. Um, so two easy ones is there's a discussion in two other IEB documents that are relevant that aren't referenced right now. And I wanted to add in uh, references to them and describe the relationship. Uh, one of those is 8170, which is the planning for protocol adoption and subsequent transitions. Mm -hmm. And there's some relevant discussion in there. And the other one is 9170, right? Uh, which is the long-term viability of protocol extension mechanisms. Both of those being IEB documents that have guidance systems, I consider to be like another one in that same series of, yes. of things, right? Which yes. are other like EDM type documents, right? Um, but then the technical things that um, I wanted to add discussion of is right now it talks about uh, greasing where it, that if all you do is what it talks about right now, I mean, the current scope is to uh, prevent the receiver and or middle boxes from crashing. I mean, that's basically what you get if all you do is what's in there. And I'm saying that's great, but it should be wider scope than that. In particular, um, if everything drops, all the, everything you try to agree since what never actually makes it to the other end, then of course nothing crashes, but you haven't necessarily mm -hmm. helped the situation, right? So I wanted to add in text that talks about should the receiver detect log or whatever, the lack of receiving any greasing. Should the receiver do something if it says, I never got any of the grease stuff, right? That's an interesting signal that says something is wrong here. What should you do in that case? I want to have some text. If people have ideas of what one might say, uh, please let me know and I will happily you know, craft some text on that topic. And then the follow on to that one is say, okay, well, if you can detect it, should or should you not, if you're doing protocol design and adding in greasing, should you have a way to have any feedback back to the sender about whether your greasing made it to the other end. What are the considerations around that? Is this a good idea? There are times that you should not do this. Right now it's silent on that topic and I think it should actually discuss that as a consideration. And so um, ideas on that topic, if, you if other people have ideas, let me know because I'm happy to write text, uh, be the author of the text for the sections to talk about that, to widen the scope just from getting the greasing at the other end, but to do something with the lack of greasing and detection and, and reporting, which can actually help improve the situation of making things go through um, so that your greasing actually says things are actually extensible, not just the fact mm -hmm. that I can detect the lack of extensibility. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Just just to respond to that one, um, we do have certain protocols with extensibility mechanisms that involve intermediaries that are allowed to to, to drop those things without mm -hmm. the protocol failing. So, uh, uh, a very interesting idea, Dave. We we want I want to discuss more with you. Um, but I do wonder if how how you square the circle around greasing is something that's like, like should be ignored, and, but that you're explicitly not ignoring it <laughs> and and then trying to create another feedback channel to to send up yeah. back. Like, yeah, we kind of had a little bit of that discussion at IHF 117 among yeah. several of us. Uh, and the example, because we, we kind of know quick or whatever, but it says, okay, let's see, you're going to apply the same example. How would it apply to say IPv6 extension headers? Okay, which is in the case that you're talking about there. And so what, you know, the compare and the contrast, how would you have done stuff if you were designing it from scratch now so that you don't end up with the same situation we have with IPv6 extension headers? What would you do? What would you do differently if you were designing the next thing or whatever? And so that's the thing that I would love to have some uh, additional sections and stuff in there about that topic. So that's what I'm volunteering to help concrete. So, so yeah, any other comments? Uh, talk to Lucas and me. It'll show up hopefully by next ITF. All right, uh, Gory. Well, okay. Um, we do do APIs in the IETF in some places. I know. And we, <laughs> and we should be doing it. So um, let's spread the good news. Um, but when it comes to this, I mean, last time I was looking at it, I was wondering, I think network-based measurement is important in getting this deployability right. So I've got map RG person here. Uh, and I think, I think this sort of thing has to be considered when we do the greasing somehow. We somehow have to know whether the tests we're doing actually go through the network so we know what works so that researchers can build big data sets over time. And there's a tussle here because greasing kind of 
obfuscates that or maybe exercises that. So I think it might be worth figuring out how the network-wide measurement thing will get some useful data from greased core points when they're visible in the network. Obviously, some of these are not visible in the network itself. My hand also Brian. shot up. Hi, Brian Dremel. My hand also shot up as soon as somebody said we don't do APIs in the uh, <laughs> adult summoned. Um, so I actually, I actually want to say something kind of like what Gory said, but with slightly different words. Uh, I did a, a control F fuzzing on the current uh, version of the document in, in protocol variability. It says this can be kind of thought of as protocol fuzzing. And so one of the things mm -hmm. that I noticed in this conversation came in a little bit late. I think I came in at the right time is we're actually talking about something that is, it can't kind of be thought of as protocol fuzzing. It's actual fuzzing of the distributed system made up of the protocol in the network dynamically in real time. And there's literature on this. And I think we should probably, mm. you know, I, this should not become a draft about fuzzing the internet using your endpoint protocols, because that is, that is a, a, a ocean that is probably better differently boiled. Um, but I think that we can like, it'd be interesting to see that, you know, can be thought of as a kind of protocol fuzzing is like, actually let's, let's go all the way down that rabbit hole and see to the extent to which we can use some of the literature in this space. Do you have, would you like to share suggestions for some of the literature you're thinking about? That we can uh, reference? I just came in and this just occurred to me. This so is like sending yes. like, <laughs> like send like emails right with now. a list of yeah, like, yeah, 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 like yeah, not yeah. now. Yes, this week. All right, here, people need, we need to get people out of the queue. It's fine. Um, all right, Chris? Yeah, um, uh, to file on to what DKG was saying, um, PPM, the PPM group also spent some time trying to uh, specify APIs that enable uh, better interrupt testing. In fact, there's a draft that's being advanced alongside the actual working group draft. It's not even adopted yet. That describes like basically the API for an interrupt test runner for MPC-like protocols, which is... Um, uh, complicated, but necessary. Um, and it, it's proven useful for some of the initial implementations that are out there. Uh, it'd be great if there were more people that did this sort of thing. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat. Uh, but PPM, uh, IPPM is inappropriately named. <laughs> <laughs> Please expand your acronyms. <laughs> That's a joke. Um, uh, DKG, uh, also, you, you, you mentioned that like people keep saying we don't do API work. I, I haven't heard that in a really long time. Is that still something you, you genuinely hear? I, I have heard it, but I'm not hearing it in this room, and that makes me very happy. Okay, great. <laughs> Please. I'm, I'm curious. Um, the context, so I was one of the people that used to say that, and in some cases still do, and just to give you the context, it's when we say that. Uh, if somebody is going to, is this, it first came up when uh, the IPv6 working group at the time, whatever the acronym was at the time, I think it was IPNG, um, wanted to define new sockets APIs. For, this is for IPv6, right? New, new socket APIs. And uh, we actually have an RFC that does that, and it's informational. And the reason it's informational is because the uh, sockets APIs are part of the POSIX standard, and the IETF doesn't own the POSIX standard. The POSIX group does. Okay, so the, the proposed standard variation is part of a different group. Um, and you say, OK, well, what about sockets APIs for JavaScript? Oh, but those are owned by W3C. Uh, what about for C++? Oh, those are owned by ISO. The point is that uh, formal language libraries are owned by other bodies outside the IETF. There exists one for many of the languages that are out there. And so what the IETF doesn't do is it doesn't do the proposed standards for languages that are owned by other bodies. Okay? And so we says, here's the C API for doing you know, the you know, TCP, the new version of QUIC or whatever it is. Well, if you want those to be part of POSIX, this is not the place to do that. So that's when we say it doesn't do APIs. It doesn't do APIs when there's some other group that's a natural place that actually claims that space. Okay. It does do things like abstract APIs. You could argue GSS API is an API. It has no language binding. Right. There are language bindings, but it's not in the RFC, right? But GSS API is an RFC, and you can say that can be proposed standard because it's abstract, right? And so the IETF does do abstract APIs. So things like TAPS that I talked yeah. about in the TAPS working group when it was created. We should be doing abstract APIs so that the appropriate other bodies can do the C binding, the JavaScript binding, the C++ binding, and so on. So that's the longer version. Makes sense? Totally agree. 
All right. Um, I got in queue um, partly to ask for clarification, uh, Dave, on the kind of the greasing feedback loop uh, proposal you had. Um, so, like, you know, think, thinking of some of the examples we have, like in the case of Quick itself, with like Quick frames or other uh, transport parameters, there are cases where at least, you know, end to end between those endpoints, we have, you know, not only is it authenticated with integrity checks, we also have acts. And so like we kind of implicitly know, like if you act this packet successfully and the whole thing didn't fall apart, you got my frame. Um, so I, I wonder if in the discussion of these feedback loops, we can also be precise in talking about cases where that is implicitly done versus when it's not done. Like in you know, V6 ascension headers, there is no automatic end-to-end -end feedback mechanism. Or in the case of HTTP intermediaries, when you don't know how many layers of abstraction you're going through and how many you know, people are really on the path that is end-to-end. -end. And then maybe kind of divvy up those categories there. Yeah, I don't already have something in mind. And, and I don't think there's anything that I would necessarily, I think it's, Unlikely, but not but but possible that I will come up with anything that would be in there. Here's what you should do, as opposed to here are the considerations yep. and yep. here's what's been done and the problems that's been come up. And so, because as you mentioned, there's a bunch of different cases. I don't think there's ever going to be here's a one size fits all prescription thing, right? But having the considerations be there to says, okay, if you're designing a new protocol, here you should do greasing, and here's the considerations you can think about which case applies to you is would be a good scope for the document, in my opinion. Great. Great. So yeah, Great. everything that you said and probably other cases too would be worthwhile to point out without necessarily having a, by the way, here's what you must do. Right, okay, cool. Um, and you know, I imagine you know, for some of these cases, and you know, sometime else we could talk about like, what is the perfect version of V6 extension headers and how should we have done it, but. Um, that was the example that somebody else brought up right. last IETF. And I said, ah, that's a good example. We could use that as an example it, of learning. It is, um, but I, you know, I wonder like for some of these cases, you, you may, sound onerous to say, oh, we need to add some feedback mechanism here. So potentially pointing to, uh, you know, re requiring an integrity check or some other thing may be another way, you know, like saying, you know, like you have to decrypt this entire thing and process it all at once to, to kind of guarantee by side effect that the greased code points were processed and used. Cool. All right. I I'm sure I'm going to miss some of that when I craft text. And so I'll be looking to you to review and suggest uh, miss <laughs> missing points. So. <laughs> Uh, Christian. Hi, uh, Christian Amthus. Um, I'd like just to say uh, thanks for doing this because I've started working on Greece for ad hoc uh, some time ago and there was a lot of input there here that is very valuable for that. You're making my life harder, but in a good way. <laughs> good. And uh, I'd love to see if, if there are specific things. It was like, oh yeah, we wouldn't have done this anyway. It'd be good to uh, highlight those so we can elevate them in the document. So, uh, so like for specific things, um, what I would have done is the, the, so in ad hoc, this is a key exchange protocol, everything's authenticated and like things can't be dropped. You can yeah, just, yeah, yeah. they can just be completely removed. Uh, the, the complete message is removed. So what I would have done already was like grease up every code point that I can, that, 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 that where this works. Um, but what I didn't think of was like what, what you mentioned about, um, keeping track of even the points where things fail completely. So if, if we have an extension mechanism like methods, um, if I picked a method that is unavailable, then there would not be anything successful that I could work on. So it's like unsuccessful anyway. But yes, keeping track of the, there was an unsuccessful attempt and responding with, um, yes, like I'm failing this, but I let you know that I've done it um, is kind of valuable. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, Lucas? So <clears throat> I've just been collecting some points of clarification questions for the, the, the enlightening discussion here. Um, so the first one is like interrupt testing is, is great. You know, we, we did a lot of that in quick, but I think maybe back in Yokohama, we were discussing an actual interrupt bug we found in the fields, like EKG's kind of online testing version of stuff. And the, the interrupt testing can only go so far in, in things and it's, they tend to be, in my experience anyway, quite pointed at, we're gonna test this aspect of the protocol, this feature, this exchange of frames. Obviously you might need a, a connection to get to that point, but then you're gonna do test 
if I send this, it gets act, and then we're going to tear everything down and move on to the next test. Um, in, in real life, you end up with connections that last hours or days or whatever, and these kind of accumulation of errors can creep in. So I, I'm a humongous fan of interrupt testing. I just wonder where it fits into the, the E, the D, or the M of this group. Is it part of the deployability? Is in a it's a good criteria to get to to deploy? Because effectively for the quick working group, we, we have continued interop running, kindly run by Martin Seaman and his infrastructure, but that isn't getting that many new tests. It's getting tests for new features. There's a proposal for multipath quick to add some testing, which is fantastic. But um, after we saw the bug in interop, we didn't go back and update that integration testing mm -hmm. framework and, and, and so on. So the amount of effort and reward is, is something I want to mull on a bit more. Um, uh, do, do, do. What else is that? Um, there's a, a draft called RTP over quick, which is defining an application uh, mapping of, of RTP over quick, um, for example, which is great. And, and I've been uh, watching along in the group that that's being standardized in. They wanted to define some error code points um, and they, they needed their own registry for those code points. And in quick errors can be uh, a value between zero and like two to the 62. So that's a humongous space and they only had five error codes. And this is a great example of something that you um, you might start with and that fits a use case and, and you want to add a new error code in five years time and then everything's going to break. So um, for me, because my brain thinks this way, yeah, uh, my suggestion was, oh, you need to be thinking about greasing. This is exactly the kind of uh, points we should be making in this document about how to do that. But what's what I find amusing is quick itself doesn't actually say grease anywhere. It, it, it heavily implies it in a roundabout way about or reserve these code points for the purpose of testing that when you receive an unknown thing, it doesn't break. Um, and I don't, I don't find that as helping these kinds of discussions because giving a name to stuff makes it more tangible. Um, and then you go and look in the document, and and you don't find it. You know, right. like Brian looked for fuzzing, and he found something to do with fuzzing, and then you know, could kind of index off of that and then come up with some ideas. So maybe some guidance on use of terminology for these things could, could help too. Yeah, I think that goes to, to, to some degree that one of the review comments I'd made on the list of, if, if we're going to make a recommendation for how to reserve this, like let's have the term we recommend and like potentially that expands beyond the IANA registry reservation mm -hmm. terms yeah. to saying like, Hey, if we want to call it Greece, call it Greece or like, you know, just come up with like, here's, here's the thing. And also allow, you know, these other protocol documents to point to this, yeah. RFC eventually to say like we're, we mean this thing. Yeah, um, we we had suggestions of other acronyms way back, but lard. Yeah, I, I wasn't a big fan of that one. Um, but but yeah, and then just the final point. Um, Colin sent some feedback to the list. Thank you. Um, uh, like a week ago or so. Um, one of the points that's relevant right now to this one. There's other stuff we should discuss, but um, you you said Colin that you. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you, you weren't convinced that the, a wide set of grease code points were, were needed when a small set could provide the similar kinds of functionality. Um, I just wondered if maybe we could pick at that because uh, extension points have different code space points and it is a bit subjective. How much of that maybe limited space do you want to waste on this greasing thing that doesn't provide any functional value, even though it's a good thing to do? Um, and, and if you have a humongous space, how little is to is, is enough? Um, and I, I don't have the answer here. I was just really curious to see. Yeah, and look, look. Let, let me start with my thoughts on this. Maybe very naive people in this working group and thinking about, or group have been thinking about a lot longer than me. But it, it seems to me that if the application is trying to actively just blow away and ignore the greasing, it really doesn't matter. If you say this whole range is reserved for grease. They'll just be like, yeah, anything in this range we instantly detect as grease and then don't handle properly in a greased way. So it seems like to me that for the most part, you need the application to not be trying to um, sort of wipe away all the greasing effectively as soon as it can and then ignore it as far into the process. And that anything that tries to do that, like whatever, the applications want to do that, you're not going to win. Um, and so if you reserved a few code points or... 25% of the code point space, you know, if the application was writing, this range is out of scope, 
and we, do, we basically ignore it because we know it's greasing. It doesn't really matter how big that range is. So I was, and my comment was more, I didn't find the text in the draft compelling to convince me against this. Um, and I wasn't arguing that maybe it, there wasn't an argument for that. Just I didn't get it out of the draft. That was sort of where I was coming from on it. No, and, and, and that's, that's the thing I would want to see. What text can we make to make it compelling? And maybe it's because we don't actually know quite yet. It's been based on draft authors who've come up with a gut feeling. Effectively, what we want is people not to hard code the grease code points in their, in their thing so that they create a function that does pattern matches and says what exactly we said. Anything in this stuff, just ignore. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think maybe that's not just really quickly. Sorry, as chair, we're about to close the queue. So if you want to hop in, hop in now. Also, let's go back to the queue. Queue and go. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we had a diversion because Lucas had clarifying well, questions. But so, I mean, um, but, I actually think there's an open question about whether reserved code points for greasing makes sense because of what because of the the risk of what we're talking about here. And I, I mean, it, it, I, I don't <laughs> like I hear Collins concern about you know over allocating that space as one example of saying should we be allocating any space at all that is reserved for that because it because it does create this sort of attractive nuisance uh, just to respond quickly to that point that the danger is if you don't reserve them then people unintentionally come in and define a new extension that's in that space that people will explicitly ignore and then we'll have interrupt failures and this is this this has happened when people like me, um, have naively just like, because the way Quick does this is weird, but you kind of go in and you pick a code point and then you, like uh, something I've wanted to do is, is make some tooling, maybe like a website where you can say, oh, give me a, a code point that's not taken by Arna and also isn't reserved by Arna, And I need five of them for my extension on it because you might pick something just before and then you're going to span and it, it's, it's terrible. Um, but th that's my point. You, you don't want to be in a position where you, especially for extensions that can be optional, like if you receive the extension, you would ignore it unless it's supported and then you will re respond. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not making much sense, but let's, let's chat some more. Br briefly coming to that, um, Kirsten. Um, but that means that it works, right? So if, if someone is using, if, if use, is using a range that they are actively ignoring and your extension is hitting that range, then breaking things is a kind of that th grease working because it shows that someone is ignoring the range rather than ignoring the optional option. Okay. Let, I want to get back on Q. So, Corey, you're up. Yeah, I'm, I'm still struggling with greasing um, at lower layers when we talk about extension heads and things like this. And I think I'm understanding a bit more why I'm troubled by it. I'm troubled by the D bit in deployability because at this layer, when it's below the transport, it breaks in a particular place. And we need to kind of know which part of the AS path this is breaking in to be able to do anything about it or understand it, I think. So mm -hmm. perhaps we need to unpick this a little bit. Increasing when it's all invisible to mm -hmm. the network is one thing, and it's we kind of know a lot about it. Increasing below where we it's visible or is being used for routing and other elements in the network it becomes a little bit more interesting to work out what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Yeah. All right, Wes. Thanks. Uh, at the risk of this being a little too <laughs> high level, um, I, I find a lot of this conversation fascinating because the AETF is a pendulum, like every organization, and we have swung from one direction to another over the course of years. Mm -hmm. And there, there are two things that have sort of come up in this. One is APIs, and the other one is, is <clears throat> why we're doing greasing in the first place, right? Um, for APIs, we always have done APIs, but it's always been you know low-level stuff that has to have a common code base because it's going to be so widely deployed to many, many applications. GSS is one of the other ones that you know hasn't been mentioned for authentication or sockets for, for network connectivity. Um, otherwise, the protocol, if you're going to talk about interoperability, should only be done on the wire, right? If you want applications to do their own, it depends on how much of a, of a common code base you need. Um, the other interesting one, of course, is way back when we had, you know, multiple levels of, of RFCs, right? We had proposed, and then in, in order to get to draft, you had to do interoperability testing. And, and that was onerous and hard, which is why we got rid of that requirement. And it was onerous and hard, and we had these, like, gigantic checkerboards of, like, every implementation on one side and every bit on the protocol on the other side of the table. 
And, and it was even that if you couldn't demonstrate that you had interoperability, you know, by multiple vendors in this field, then, you know, you were encouraged in the draft version to remove that field from the protocol, like, or, you know, just leave it blank now or something like that, right? Or all zeros, non-greasing. Um, this encouraged, you know, stability so that, especially for core routers and things like that, that's actually kind of important at the very cost of ossification. So greasing is like the opposite end of the extreme, right? Now we're coming back into... How do we do this? And the, the funny thing is, you know, most of the world has moved to continuous integration and, you know, pushing instead of static code, we're doing runtime checking, right? A lot of languages are doing that now. You don't, you don't have an error until you actually are trying to do stuff. That to me is sort of the point of greasing. And, you know, I think these sort of concepts would be good to put into the top of the document saying, you know, th this is why we're doing this is that we, we are enabling the, the market uh, the, the ability for the market to move at a pace is that it was just never able to before. Um, so high level, apologize for that. Lucas again? There, you're done? Okay. Um, I jumped in, oh, you have a slides request. <laughs> no, no, I rejected your slides request. I think, I think my phone is greasing the, <laughs> the, the, the echo. <laughs> All right, um, I, I didn't cue myself uh, back when uh, we were having a clarification question to Colin um, about, you know, do you need too many points? You know, I, I think the document does, and it can be clarified, but a good job of explaining why, you know, we need more than one. Like, if we just have the one code point, then everyone's just going to be like, oh, I'm going to ignore that one. Um, but I agree that like, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be hundreds or like this huge space. So I think we could be you know, do a bit of just like analysis on here of like based almost it's almost like based on like the frequency of how often you're sending greased things to just make it such that you can't just like easily filter the pattern. And so like depending on the size of the space and how frequent it is, that should somehow influence the the amount of things you reserve, if you reserve at all. Because I think you know, you know, it's good to have that debate of if you even need it. Um, you know, I think there's discussion within, I mean, if you're like greasing HTTP headers or something like, um, that's clearly not a space where you can just like allocate from strings um so that would need a very different approach so i don't think it's like sometimes it's appropriate to allocate but not always yeah, just to respond to that one quickly i there was some discussion i think martin thompson was in in the last meeting or the one before where mm -hmm. even, even though um in in quick it's that the space is allocated at regular intervals the way that we encode those numbers on the wire means it's actually a bit unfair in terms of, of how things are done so this all seems very computer science-y to me. Like, I wonder if someone would want to take a task to go away and maybe you could come up with some kind of algorithm that says, you know, it's fine to pick two until you have this much space and then do this thing. Right. right. And maybe a few variances of those based on all of the different ways that the IETF defines its protocols. Cool. Okay, David? Yeah, I think uh, there's an interesting... Um, tussle here because on one end um let's say if you know your approach to greece was just oh do something random if you have an 8-bit field do something random might end up colliding with something that's in use and then hilarity will ensue because you just send random garbage in some very important security field um and on the other end of the spectrum you have the fact that if you say, okay, every even thing is for greasing and everyone in their code said, if the, if it's even, then ignore, you've accomplished exactly nothing. Um, and so it's, it's kind of tricky. And I think that that specific question and the fact that this is like subtle and nuanced is why we need this document in one of our earlier EDM meetings. Uh, we were talking, I think about greasing and it was, I think probably the first meeting where we discussed this document was when we were like, well, what's new protocol, what's hot off the press these days? And like, oh, MLS is in working group last call. Are they doing greasing? And I like followed an issue, like you should do greasing. And I ended up having like many back and forth and many conversations about, oh, no, 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 not quite like this. You have to do it like that. And you also can't do it for the field where if you don't understand the extension, then you failed up 
like joining the message group because then all of a sudden your grease breaks everything. And I realized, oh, we need to write this down because the questions the MLS folks were asking were 100% valid. And I was kind of making up answers on the fly from having spent time working on quick. And so I don't know if there's an answer that completely precludes the like a determined implementer who wants to like single out receiving grease values. But if we make it just subtle and hard enough to say like, no, no, really don't do that. We can still accomplish something, even though a silly implementer can do silly things. And that's just always going to be true. All right. And then Ellie. Okay. Can you speak in the microphone for the remote Sorry. folks? My comment is not about Greece but I can wait until you conclude on Greece. Okay. I mean, I think we're kind of at the end of the queue and time I want to let people, if they want to be able to grab lunch, do that. So I was planning on wrapping up here anyway. Um, yeah. Just let us have this comment and then we'll do the wrap up. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Let's go for it. Um, basically what I wanted to say is you commented that after Greece work is over, mm -hmm. you plan to wrap the program. Now, potentially, unless unless there's other okay. good stuff to do. <laughs> exactly. So when I look at your mandate uh, of evolvability, deployability, maintainability, mm -hmm. I see that there is a connection with sustainability. You know, there is a new sustainability program. Mm -hmm. And have you looked at your tasks or, let's say, scope with a view on sustainability? Because everything this... Uh, would do to, uh, let's say, add longevity to protocols and implementations, build into making them more sustainable in the sense that you can reuse and rebuild and repurpose things. And that's a prime sustainability topic. So maybe there are things you can take on board or maybe discuss with the e-impact uh, program to see where right. my, my, my inclination here is, you know, since both are IAB programs and you know, the, that that discussion sounds like it's great to bring up within e-impact um, if, if we think that's applicable. Um, I guess if there are concrete things um, you know, that you have in mind, for example, like sharing it with both lists, I think would be interesting. And we can just kind of see where that picks up. Um, okay. And to... To add to that, I think what makes IB programs successful and working groups in general at the ATF is a very tight scope uh, because otherwise like, it kind of goes all over the place. So that's why we have those two separate programs with separate scope. That said, if there are topics that are between the two, having documents that consult between them is something that happens every so often, definitely with working groups, and we can also do that here. So I would say I wouldn't increase our scope to put that in, but if some, some discussion happens halfway between both, that's totally fine. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I just want to quickly add that we have these programs because uh, this, these are topics that are of interest from, for the IAB, and we want to have more input from, from experts, but at the end, all this input will come back to the IAB, and that where everything merges together. So I think like trying to have the discussion in e impact is probably the right approach at this point. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great. All right. Um, I think we want to wrap up here. Thank you for all the discussion and input. I think... Uh, we have lo lots of things that can contribute to a revision of this. Um, so, and, and thank you for taking notes. We'll kind of compile those out, send them. Um, thank you, Dave, for volunteering to help on the document. So, you know, both of you, please, you know, send stuff as you're working on that or thinking about stuff to the list um, about what you're thinking about or send out, you know, the PRs, et cetera. And we can all chime in and follow up there. Thank you. And see you next time.